Hello, I'm going to read in a moment from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, starting in verse 1. We're going to focus today on the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. I'm going to read from Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments appear. They appear again in the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 5. We're going to focus on the Exodus passage. I'll read the scriptures and then pray. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do not do any work, you or your son, or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the seas and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. This is the word of God. Let's pray and then turn to, um, to, to this passage. Almighty God, we gather before you this day and we beg you that you would speak to us powerfully in your living word. We thank you that your word is living and active, as living now as it was when it was first written down. Lord, we thank you that your word is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it pierces even to the division of bone and marrow, of soul and spirit. Lord, we ask that you would, in your power and authority, and in your grace and tenderness, speak to us as we look at the 10th commandment, this challenging commandment. Help us, Lord God. Show us Christ. Show us your grace, living God, we pray, that we may be more like Jesus and that we may realise how desperately needy we are of your salvation, Lord. Help us, we pray, to love you more and to love your law more, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do turn with me in God's word uh, to the passage we just read um, and particularly to the 10th commandment. Um, Exodus chapter 20 verse 19. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey 
or anything that belongs to your neighbour. In economics, there is an index that represents inequality of income distribution in a given area. It's called the Gini coefficient. It can represent income distribution in just a street or in a city or a town um, or in a county or even in an entire country. In places where there is a relatively flat income distribution, so that means that everyone has a similar amount um, of income, there is almost always a lower crime, uh, uh, crime rate. On the other hand, in places with an unequal income distribution in a given area, there is almost always a higher crime rate. The Gini coefficient um, works out and is demonstrably true in every place where it has been studied and applied. So what does it mean? It means that absolute poverty does not lead to violent crime and a higher crime rate. What does cause crime, especially violent crime, is income distribution inequality. What does this look like? My neighbour has a much better car than me, a bigger house than me, a better job than me, so how do I respond? I want what he has. And this leads to greater aggression because I feel I can't get what he has. So violence and crime follow. If I cannot get a higher social status and, and have what my neighbour has, because my neighbour is just way beyond me, I can make my mark on this local area of the community and raise my social status through violence and crime. Relative poverty, that is unequal income distribution, leads to crime, always. And this is the problem, economically, that the Tenth Commandment addresses at its very root, that is sin in the human heart. As we look um, at this commandment, we're going to look just briefly at the beginning about what it means for us today, these commands given um, at Mount Sinai to God's people, how do they apply to us today? And then we'll compare the Tenth Commandment in Exodus and Deuteronomy and see the differences. And then we'll look at the issue of covetousness as opposed to contentment and then looking at what it means to fear God, and then finally focus our hearts and minds on the Lord Jesus Christ. So firstly, the 10th commandment for today. When the 10th commandment, ten commandments were given to God's people, the Lord had redeemed them from slavery in Egypt, and the wording of the 10 commandments is really clearly in this historical context, isn't it? The Lord says very clearly, I am the Lord your God at the beginning of the 10 commandments, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the context, isn't it? The Lord makes it clear that the Ten Commandments um, bring freedom, not further slavery, because the living God has brought his people out of Egypt. He's brought them out of slavery. He's not then going to put them back into slavery with himself as the new um, uh, overlord in that way. Instead, God makes it clear he is a gracious redeemer. And this is the law that God gives to his people to give them perfect freedom, to help them be what they were meant to be. Just like the train tracks um, for a, a locomotive, those tracks might seem constricting uh, and decreasing freedom, but actually they help the locomotive be what it is designed to be. The Ten Commandments are for us as humans what the train tracks are for the locomotive. The Ten Commandments are a codification of God's perfect moral law, which is from God's perfect character and nature. They're written, as Deuteronomy 5.22 tells us, by the finger of Almighty God on stone tablets and given to the people. But the law of God is also written on our hearts. In Romans 2 verse 14 to 15 it says, For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, that is they didn't receive the Ten Commandments at Sinai, when they do it instinctively, the things of the law, these, that's the Gentiles, 
not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts. What does this mean? It means that every one of the Ten Commandments is morally binding on all people at all times. Whether you are a Jew who was there at Sinai at the time, living in national Israel at that time, or if you are a Gentile living in the 21st century in the UK. God's law, all of the Ten Commandments, are morally binding. The believer, we're told in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, um, is not under the law, but under grace. And many people would say that therefore means that we're not under the Ten Commandments anymore. And people would focus um, on the command to keep the Sabbath day holy, saying that's not for Christians. But Paul doesn't mean that in Romans 6.14. He means that the Ten Commandments are still morally binding, but we are not as Christians condemned because we break the Ten Commandments, which we do all the time in our sin. We are morally bound by the Ten Commandments, but our salvation is only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's compare Exodus and Deuteronomy as they give the Ten Commandments um, God's sacred law. The Ten Commandment is a little bit different in Deuteronomy um, than it is in Exodus, and the order of the particular things in this Tenth Commandment that you are not to covet changes slightly. In Exodus, the order is house, wife, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything. You are not to covet these things in Exodus. In Deuteronomy, the order is changed. Wife comes first, house, field, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, anything. Deuteronomy also adds another word to help us understand what coveting is. It uses the second word to explain it, and the word is desire. Desire. The word used for desire is the kind of a strong urge for something that quickly leads to a sinful action. There's the sinful desire in the heart, and it leads to a sinful action. The same word for desire in Deuteronomy in the Tenth Commandment is used a little bit later in Deuteronomy, in chapter 7, verse 25. It says this, when the Israelites came across, um, it speaks about the Israelites coming across graven idols as they conquer the land, and they're commanded by God, do not covet the silver or gold that is on these graven images, and don't take them. So you can imagine the scene the Israelites come into the land that they're going to take possession of. They see these graven images and they're carved with great care and expertise and they're overlaid with gold and silver. And the Israelites see them and they have this desire for the gold and silver and they take it. A sinful desire leads to a sinful action. Achan does the same thing in Joshua chapter 7 verse 21. Do you remember when he sees the silver um, and the garments um, and he sees them and he takes them. There's the sinful desire and it leads to a sinful action. In both of these cases, the word is desire and it's the same word used in Deuteronomy. The desire in those two passages is for gold or silver, something physical. But in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25, the desire isn't for, for gold or silver, but it's a sexual desire. Proverbs 20, uh, chapter 6, verse 24 to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. Now the coveting is specifically a desire for another man's wife, or a woman who may in the future be the wife of another man, but she is certainly not your wife. It's the same word desire, and it's the emotion of covetousness. Lust and the viewing of pornography are not just a breaking of the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Lust and the viewing of pornography is a breaking of the tenth commandment too, thou shalt not covet. And it shows us how profoundly heart-centred the ten commandments really are. They get right to the root of the issue, right to the very core 
whether it be lust, a desire in our hearts for something that we don't have sexually, or whether it be a lust and a desire for material objects, your neighbor's car that's nicer and faster than yours, or your neighbor's house, when we talked about income, unequal income distribution and the Gini coefficient. Lust and desire are forms of coveting, and the emotion of coveting is this desire. So we've looked at the Ten Commandments for us today. We've seen then, secondly, comparing the two uh, forms of the Tenth Commandment in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And then thirdly, covetousness, we're going to um, compare it to contentment, the, the opposite end of the spectrum. What does it mean to covet? The Westminster Shorter Catechism is really, really helpful on this, um, on the Tenth Commandment. It says that to covet is to cherish an unlawful desire for anything that belongs to another. Covetousness is not being content with what you've got and thinking that you would be content if you had some of your neighbour's stuff. Covetousness harbours feelings of resentment for your neighbour because he's got stuff that you haven't or because he is someone, he's done stuff, he's got things that you don't. The opposite of coveting is contentment. And so the Tenth Commandment is a command negatively not to covet and positively to be content with what you have. To be content. And this way, the commandment clearly strikes right at the core of our culture. This command strikes right at the heart. Social media is filled with discontentment. Violent crime is fueled by an increased awareness of inequality in wealth distribution and therefore in what your neighbour has got that you haven't got. At root, the capitalist financial system is powered and fueled by human greed, discontentment, coveting. Now that's not a political statement, it's just an economic statement of fact. Again and again, the Lord warns us about covetousness and the godliness of contentment in the scripture. If you look in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Let's apply that to the imaginary neighbour who's got everything that you want that you don't have. Even if your neighbour's got everything, that doesn't dictate who he is. I find it fascinating looking in graveyards at people's gravestones. What is it that appears on a person's gravestone? It's not their property. It's not their education, it's not their job even. It's rarely what people have done. What matters and what lasts and what stays on the gravestone is Christ. So often we see verses from the scriptures and the persons trusting in the Lord and their relationships. A grandmother, a wife, a sister, a friend. Our lives don't consist of the stuff we've got. Galatians chapter 5 verse 26, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. 1 Timothy 6 8, if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Hebrews 13 5 to 6, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, and that strikes at the root of covetousness, doesn't it? Being content, the opposite of covetousness, with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Paul the Apostle shares his heart to the Philippians, doesn't he, and tells them about the secret of contentment. He says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 11, not that I speak from want, 
for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learnt the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering needs. What's the secret? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is Paul's secret. He looks to Jesus, not to himself. Now in this verse, Paul doesn't elaborate on that, but we can bring the rest of scripture that speaks about covetousness and contentment to bear to, to fill in what it means to know Verse 13 of Philippians 4, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So we come to the fear of God versus the fear of man. We've looked at covetousness versus contentment. And now we go to the root of it. Fear of God is contentment and fear of man is covetousness. A right view of ourselves is dependent and founded upon a right view of God. If you have a wrong view of God, your understanding of yourself will also be wrong. A wrong view of ourselves always then in turn leads to discontentment because it focuses on us and then naturally compares us and what we've got with our neighbours, our friends, our family, colleagues and what they've got that we don't. When our attention is taken away from us and onto God in the right way, the natural consequence is contentment. So what is the right way to view God? It's fear, fearing God, because he is a consuming fire and he is our creator and our redeemer. In some of the verses that I've read, fear of God is linked really closely to contentment in a clear and apparent way. In the passage we read in Hebrews 13, it says um, from verses five, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, that's covetousness, being content with what you have. Why? Because God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. If we look to God and have a fear of God, then we are content and we don't be, we're not afraid. Specifically, we don't need to fear man. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, 6. After the Ten Commandments are given at Sinai in Exodus, the same thing happens. We're given the commandments. We're told to fear God and that leads us to stop sinning. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. That is, don't be terrified uh, and hysterical, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him, so do be afraid of God in a good way, the fear of him may remain with you. And what's the benefit of that? Verse 20, so that you may not sin. The fear of the Lord is wisdom, Job 28, 28 tells us. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. Wisdom does not covet what your neighbour has because wisdom understands that a man's life doesn't consist in his stuff, in what he's got. And wisdom is content with what we have and glad for our neighbour for what he has rather than comparing ourselves and what we don't have with our neighbour and what he does have. When we fear God properly, we see humans as they are, all of us, made of dust and one day returning to dust. Fleeting, like a vapour, like spray on a wave in the ocean, like grass that withers and is blown away or burnt in a furnace. Humans are so transient. We live several decades and we're gone and we're forgotten. We're made of dust and we return to dust. Comparing what I've got in this life with what my neighbour's got in this life and seeing I haven't got what he's got and then being angry and resentful and then and coveting leads to sin and just has a hugely inflated view of stuff and of humans. 
It is foolishness, it is lack of wisdom to covet because it is a wrong view of God, a wrong view of humans created by God and a wrong view of the stuff that God gives us. The right perspective, fear of God, brings contentment because we see what we are and what others are and we're content. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. We've looked then, haven't we, at, um, at the Ten Commandments for us today, generally, and seen that the Ten Commandments, all of them, are morally binding on all people, Christian or not, at all times and in all places. And then we've compared Exodus with Deuteronomy on the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. And then we've looked at con con uh, covetousness and compared it to contentment. And then we've gone down to the roots and seen that covetousness is linked to fear of man and contentment is linked to fear of God. So if you're coveting, part of the solution is to fear God rather than fearing human beings and having a right view of God so that we would fear him and a right view of humans so that we wouldn't fear humans. And then we also finally, as we conclude, see Jesus, our saviour. Firstly, we see Jesus because he, in his life on earth, never coveted. He perfectly kept the Ten Commandments in every respect. On the outside, he said to the Pharisees, of what sin do you condemn me or accuse me? Nothing. He was morally perfect, above reproach, unimpeachable in every way, by his enemies even. They had to lie and make up stories in order to try and accuse him. And they finally did try and accuse him of blasphemy. And yet Christ's words were wonderfully and gloriously true, that he is God the Son made man. When we look at Christ, we see his perfect life. He kept the Ten Commandments in every way. And yet he died on the cross to take away the sin of those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome saviour. Friends, if your faith is in Jesus and you struggle with covetousness, know the glory of sin and guilt taken away because Jesus died on the cross. He died to take away your coveting. He died to free you also from the need to covet. How does he do that? This is our second point of application and it is so liberating. Thomas Chalmers, the great Puritan writer, speaks about the expulsive power of a new affection. If a believer struggles with coveting, we see what our neighbour has and I want it. And I think I won't be happy until I've got it because my happiness depends on having that thing. Partly, we understand fear of man and fear of God, covetousness and contentment, and then we fill that up perfectly by being able to be drawn away from our desire for that thing and the belief in the happiness it will bring if we have it to looking wonderfully and fully at Jesus. The expulsive power of a new affection. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, our saviour, all longing for ephemeral and transient and passing things, stuff, just doesn't have the same pull anymore. If your neighbour's got a brand new car, we've got a neighbour um, who's got an amazing yellow Mustang um, with blue stripes on it, it it's lovely. It'd be nice to have a car like that, but I know that even if I did, it wouldn't be on my gravestone. It is fleeting, it is passing, it's just stuff. Maybe you are waiting for something and you don't know the answer yet. And you believe that if you get a good answer, your life will be complete. You will be vindicated. You'll prove yourself to others. And yet that is just so wrong-headed, isn't it? We need to look to Christ Jesus. All that he has accomplished. Not what we have accomplished, but what he has accomplished. We need to look at Jesus and what he is. Our glorious saviour. God the Son made man. Our redeemer our high priest, our saviour. 
Friends, look to Jesus and be satisfied in him and let your overflowing satisfaction in Christ remove that neediness, that covetousness, that desire we have for things that don't belong to us. And that wrong-headed thinking that if we get them, we'll have a meaningful life. No, the only thing that brings meaning, dear friends, is Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we close, let's fix our eyes on Jesus and pray. Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, how we praise you for our lovely Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Lord Jesus, you are the fairest of 10,000. Lord Jesus, you are altogether lovely in every way. Lord Jesus, you are beautiful in your holiness. Lord, we're so sorry for our covetousness. How could we want anything in, in a way that would even come close to your loveliness? Oh Lord Jesus, help us, we pray, to look to you and see you are right to fear you, the living God, and to love you, Lord. And that that love and that fear would cast out covetousness for things that are fleeting, things that other people have that we don't. Help us, we pray, not to covet. Help us, we pray, not to fear other people and compare ourselves to them. Help us have a right view of you, Lord God, to fear you. You are a consuming fire. And help us to love you, Lord God, more and more. You are so precious. We pray in Christ's name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.